Conor McGregor footage of the ultimate fighter. If you enjoy our content, consider leaving like, subscribe and ring the bell. John Jones training footage in pool. Good, one deep breath. Chael Sonnen about Shavkat Rachmanov. We have a wildly impressive guy who has not mastered the English language, who is from a different part of the world, who can come in at welterweight, and in theory, possibly be the champion today. We have our new Chemayev. Fine. What am I going to say about him other than he sucks at marketing and one of his three names is apparently Rachmano? What am I going to say? His opponent coming up. Okay, great. We're starting somewhere. Who is that opponent? Okay, I didn't get the name, but I got the date. They're going to be fighting on March 4th. They're going to be fighting on the same card as John Jones and Surreal Gone. So what does it mean for Chemayev to have that kind of exposure? I apologize, Rachmanov, to have that kind of exposure in the heels of having a report that Chemayev is gone. And I was asked to sit down and make a piece about that. And I'm stuck. I just don't know if that's his first name, last name, or his nickname. I also don't know who his opponent is. I also don't know if this match matters to him. I also don't know who his trainer is. I also don't know what gym he's fighting out of. And those are things that I usually have for meaningful fighters. If you were to throw a meaningful fighter at me, and you asked me who trains him, I would know. I could go a little further and tell you who his workout partners are. If you asked me what the name of his gym went, I would know. I could probably even tell you where it was located. I could probably tell you what city or what state it's located in. I don't have any of these things on Rachmanov. That doesn't make that bad. That makes it mysterious. And mystery is good. Generally. It's a really interesting spot. Because if we have a guy who's 16-0 and 0 with all finishes, if we have a guy at welterweight who has never been beaten and has beaten more welterweights than anybody else in welterweight history, not just currently, it sounds as though we've got a guy that we would move in line for a title shot, but we wouldn't do it if we thought he was a knockoff to another guy who happens to be named Chemayev. And for whatever reason, whether it's fair or not, if we have in our perception that Rachmanov is a ripoff to Chemayev, we're going to have to do things with Chemayev before we do them to Rachmanov, but now we've removed Chemayev at least possibly. I have a question before we wrap up. What's that? How are you feeling <clears throat> mentally as like the Henry fight's announced? Are you, how excited are you that it's coming up? I'm very excited. You know, it's one of those things. When he got to fight for the vacant belt at 135, I was very, very salty because he cut the line. Okay. And there's nothing worse than someone who comes in and just cuts the line because you feel like, like Nate Diaz, you're taking everything I worked for. Like, I'm going to fight you. Like, that's legit how I felt. Um and then he left the game right after that. So he fought he fought Marlon Marais. He had a great performance after getting crushed in that first round. He showed some great resiliency, some mental toughness. And then he fights Dominic Cruz on short notice. 
But, you know, Dom took the fight on short notice. So once you decide to make that walk, you make that walk in the commitment. So there's no excuses there. But you have to break. You got to take that into consideration when you're analyzing and breaking down a matchup. So I, I give him some like credit for that win. But at the same time, it's kind of like a Domina Cruz who was in full fight camp. Does that fight look like that? Did he get a, like the chance to really break down and prepare himself for the leg kicks of Sayudo um, to do things the right way? So, yeah, I, I'm excited. I think I got my work cut out for me. And um, this should be a very fun fight. At this week, UFC 285, all the talks about John Jones, of course, because he's coming back and everyone's missed him inside the octagon. And he's a legend of the sport and he's a bad man and he's an intriguing character. And when I say he's a bad man, I mean he's a bad man inside the octagon. I'm not talking about his shenanigans. No, I'm talking about he is a bad man inside that octagon. But do you know who else is a bad man? Do you know who else is an absolute machine, a knockout artist, and a man that you do not want to trifle with? Okay, that's his opponent, Cyril Garn. I mean, let me tell you, this man is absolutely gigantic. When you saw him and Francis Ngannou square up against one another in the ring, Cyril was a bigger man. Okay, he looked absolutely gigantic, and he literally does, to quote the great Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. He is so light-footed. He dances around the octagon. He's got insane cardio, instant urban cat-like reflexes. Okay, doesn't seem to get tired, but he needs to work on the takedown defense. Now, before coming over to the UFC, Cyril Garn was a tremendously talented kickboxer and had a great career, went 13 and all. But what we're going to do right now, we're going to go through some stats and then I'm going to give you some thoughts on the fight this weekend and what Cyril needs to do to be successful. Okay, so coming into this one, Cyril Garn is 10 and 1 in mixed martial arts. As you know, he was the former UFC interim heavyweight champion. He stands at 6 foot 5 and has an 81 inch reach. So that's that's a three and a half inch deficit. And against John Jones, because of course it's a wingspan reach, that'll give him about an actual one and a half inch reach deficit on each arm. So not too much. And Jones is used to fighting people with long arms, let me tell you. Now, when it comes to his UFC rankings and his title, Cyril Garn currently, obviously, is the number one contender. He knocked out Taito Avasa in France September last year in Paris. I called the fight a sensational performance. Yes, granted, Taito Avasa caught him, sat him down, and Taito thought he'd won the fight for a split second, but Cyril jumped back up and continued to put the beat down on him, used those front kicks to the stomach, beautiful footwork, just a great shot selection, and the right hand that he dropped him with to finish the night was just timed perfectly. And the footwork to get him himself into position really was a thing of beauty if you understand mixed martial arts. The way he pivoted off the fence, turned it round 180, right hand sat him down and then ground and pound to finish. Now, of course, as I said before, he became the interim heavyweight champion when he knocked out Derek Lewis at UFC 265. And listen, we know Derek Lewis. He's got the most knockouts in the history of the UFC.